I'll be turning 90 in three weeks. <laughs> and I still find that the fewer clothes I have on, the more fun I'm having. <laughs> And we're off with a bang. OK. Uh, this, this is wonderful. Wow. OK. So I have a few questions uh, for you, uh, Professor Chickering, uh, before we turn it out to our wonderful uh, students and alumni to ask questions as well. And before we start, we just heard from uh, Mama Gaga, right, which was, which was amazing. But it's uh, truly a privilege to be able to sit in front of uh, a room of our distinguished alumni and also our current students who are going to be doing uh, the work in which some might call you uh, the Papa Gaga of, uh, <laughs> of uh, student development theory. And it's just a, it's just a privilege to, uh, to have, be able to spend some time with you uh, over the next, uh, I guess, hour we have. Well, I'm lucky to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to delve right in. So uh, many of our students and alumni in the room are here to celebrate you as one of our uh, distinguished uh, alumni award winners this year. And some of them might be daydreaming, as uh, we're sitting here right now, of making a contribution in their own field um, and maybe sitting up here in the future being uh, interviewed as a distinguished alumna or alumnus. And for all of us, would you share, us a little, share a little bit about your background? What brought you to TC originally? And what made you come back uh, today, besides the award? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, without going into my life history, I majored in comparative literature at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Uh, graduated in 1950. And uh, I was uh, very interested in, I thought, reading novels and poems and plays and writing and reading about them, talking about them was a good way to earn a living. But I had to support myself, so I went, uh, I managed to get myself into the Harvard Graduate School and their Master of Arts in Teaching English program. Uh, and during the fall semester, I applied for the PhD program and got accepted at the University of Wisconsin in their program in comparative literature. Uh, I had my practice teaching at Newton High School halfway through my second semester in the spring. Uh, and I had a wonderful teacher, uh, Mrs. Armstrong. She was about five feet two and quite round, <laughs> but a very experienced English teacher. And uh, they were reading Silas Marner. And so she asked me to prepare a lesson plan and start teaching Silas Marner. So I spent the weekend uh, using my well-honed literary analytic skills, uh, outlining comments to share all my wise insights about Silas Miner and the characters and plots and so forth. And uh, I was eager when class time came Monday morning, and she turned the class over to me. And I started sharing my wisdom. And after about, <laughs> after about five minutes, <laughs> Mrs. Armstrong jumped up and <laughs> shook her hands and she said, telling is not teaching. And that was the most important lesson I learned during my year at Harvard. But the other thing that happened as we talk <coughs> talked about Silas Marner, and subsequently mill on the floss, is that I, this, under her wise leadership, students were using those novels to process their relationships with authority, with their parents, with their peers, uh, with the culture they were finding themselves in. And I found I was much more interested in hearing and dealing with students as they 
uh, were trying to metabolize their learning in terms of their own situation. So I uh, found out about uh, Teachers College TC's school psychology program and canceled my uh, enrollment plans for University of Wisconsin and came to TC in school psychology. So that's how I, I found my way here. And why did you decide to come back? <laughs> come back here? Yeah, I was today. invited to do so. <laughs> no, I have to admit that uh, although I've been in and out of Manhattan off and on for conferences and to see the Lion King and so forth, I haven't been back to spend any time at TC, even though I was very good friends with Cynthia Johnson and Lee Neffelkamp, and I knew Steve Brookfield and other faculty members here. I never had occasion to come back here. Well, I'm glad that someone's extended the invitation <laughs> so we get to well, have you come back. So am I. <laughs> Uh, you're most famous in, student affair, in the student affairs world for your uh, seven vectors. And I think I told you when I was sending my introductory email that when I was on the faculty at the University of Maryland, we actually called our orient, new student orientation vector zero and <laughs> our graduation celebration from the student affairs program, the eighth vector. Uh, so you've made an impact in multiple ways. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how uh, the seven vectors came about. Well. <clears throat> Uh, when I came here, I really was interested in the impact of educational policies and practices and teaching on students and on their, what we then called affective development as well as their intellectual development. And uh, my wonderful advisor, Gertrude Driscoll, uh, after she became a uh, acquainted with my interests, uh, suggested that maybe educational leadership and administration would be a better career path for me than school psychology, doing diagnostic workups and psychotherapy and so forth. School psych program then in uh, the 50s was highly clinically oriented. And she, uh, when I finished my residency, uh, recommended me to uh, Verda Wentley, the Director of Psychological Services at the Woodmere Hewlett School District on Long Island, an upper middle class, highly competitive school district. And Verda, in contrast to the dominant orientation of school psychologists that time, had a, a preventive community mental health approach to her work. So we spent time regularly meeting with the school superintendent, with school principals, a lot of time meeting with teachers who were having problems with students, but more time with teachers who were giving problems, <laughs> creating <laughs> problems with students, damaging their self-esteem and uh, creating a variety of emotional problems. So for three years, that sort of plunged me into a more deep understanding of those uh, dynamics. And I, by chance, uh, had a chance to become director uh, and uh, creator of a new teacher education program at Monmouth College, uh, <clears throat> which was then just moving from being a two-year community college to a four-year institution. And when President Schaefer interviewed me, he said, I want to have the best teacher's college in New Jersey. So I said, great. And I hadn't had a very good experience at Harvard. The only course I had that had any impact on me was Robert Ulick's philosophy of education, which introduced me to Dewey's thinking. And I became a Dewey devotee. <laughs> so during the fall, I started to create, and I did create, an advisory board of 
local school administrators and teachers because I wanted students to be in the schools in some fashion in relation to every course they were taking. At Harvard, I never got near a classroom until I had my teaching, practice teaching experience. And so in January, the president called me and he had a rather violent temper and he turned red and cursed me out for creating that advisory board. <coughs> uh, he, he said, I was planning on, I'm counting on this teacher's education program to generate the revenue with, that I can use to build dormitories. And I said, well, that's not my understanding of why you brought me here. So he fired me. And, but he didn't send me the notification of my dismissal uh, until it uh, was dated February 2nd. And the uh, understanding with the AUP at that time, American Association of University Professors, was that you had to be notified by February 1st, no later than February 1st. So I sued him with uh, help from uh, AUP, they helped me hire a lawyer. But during that time, I was friendly with a biology teacher who knew about my progressive education devotion. And he told me about this little college in Vermont called Goddard College that was anchored in progressive education principles. Jim Pitkin, the president, had studied here with Dewey and uh, Kilpatrick. And uh, my wife and I and our then infant son, our, well, by then in uh, 58, 59, we had three kids. Uh, we loved to ski and hike in Vermont, so I wrote to Goddard. And they had just received a <coughs> Ford Foundation grant for a six-year experiment, quote, experiment in college curriculum organization. And they needed a, a, someone to evaluate that program. So I was employed as coordinator of evaluation half time and to teach psychology half time. Uh, and when I went to Goddard, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I'll read you a quote. It comes from, I have this latest Cool Passion book. This is, Commercial comes with this. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but the, uh, the guts of the book are five chapters in which co authors comment on the impact of my work over the last 55 years or so. And the second chapter, uh, done with George Koo, who many of you know. Uh, created the National Survey of Student Engagement, and so forth. And uh, so in this, I described uh, what I found at Goddard. Uh, <coughs> and the Goddard proposal those of you familiar with the first edition with education and identity will recognize this language. Goddard posited five desired outcomes that were to be achieved through this experiment. Developing intellectual and interpersonal competence and an increased sense of competence. Increasing emotional and instrumental independence with the recognition of interdependence, developing identity, freeing interpersonal relationships, and developing integrity. And the first fall I was there, as we were discussing, Goddard had 180 students. Every Friday afternoon, we would sit around with the, in Tim Pitkin, the president's living room, and after we had Sherry, we'd talk about educational issues. <laughs> Uh, and we identified two more desired outcomes, managing emotions and developing purpose. And so 
education and identity was really rooted in the desired outcomes positive at Goddard. And I, <laughs> I remember clearly when I uh, was talking with Forrest Davis, what to call these things, he, he was then the academic dean. He suggested the word vector because vector is something that has direction and force. So that's how, and I wanted some distinguished term that would sort of uh, be memorable. And, and I was very, <coughs> I'll, I'll read you another quote that was very helpful. <coughs> because Goddard carries on continuous research aimed at the improvement of teaching, students are asked to take part in various research studies. A student's participation may involve filling out questionnaires, taking various experiential measures of attitudes, interests, and achievement. And so I was able to administer 16 hours of achievement tests, the omnibus personality inventory, which George Young and uh, Paul Heist had just developed at Berkeley, a religious orientation questionnaire, uh, a whole series of measures that I re-administered at the second and fourth and sixth years. So I had that longitudinal data from the students. And then during the semesters, Goddard had a work program where every student worked 20 hours a week. And I had five students working with me. And I created an experience of college questionnaire that we administered periodically that gathered rich data. I, I took a sample of students and we gathered diary data about how they were spending their time we had folk, are now called focus groups. It was, this is very small educational community. Uh, so I had a rich pool of data that I used to look at uh, what became the seven vectors. And following that, Ernest Boyer, who later became head of the SUNY system and uh, head of the Office of Education. He was a good friend of Tim's. And he and Tim had gotten a, uh, a National Institute of Mental Health grant for a project with 13 small colleges that were part of what was then the Council for the Advancement of Small Colleges, a four-year project that would try to replicate what we were doing at Goddard, that would gather data about students' characteristics and their experiences and try to feed that data back to encourage change at the institutions. And then Ernie got recruited to be chancellor or vice chancellor of the SUNY system, so they asked me to do that project, which I did from 64 to 69. And that enriched the body of data that I had from 13 very diverse institutions, ranging from evangelical colleges like William Jennings Bryan in Dayton, Tennessee, and Westmont, California, to Goddard and Scheimer in Mount Carroll, Illinois. So that's kind of a long answer, but the, that's both the, the, where the initial uh, labeling of the vectors, if you will, came from, but where all the research came from that uh, uh, undergirded the kind of hypotheses I posed uh, in education and identity about what kinds of educational cultures and experiences had an impact on various vectors. So I guess we should say, thank goodness you were fired. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I owe President Schaefer's hot temper a <laughs> uh, debt of gratitude. <laughs> That's right. And, and Actually, uh, he became president emeritus 
the fall after he hired, fired me because the board, when I was suing him and so forth, the board asked me to meet with them and I told them about what was going on and why and, and also that was going on in, it was part of a larger dynamic at the college where we were uh, preparing for accreditation visit. And uh, we department heads would write our reports and then the president and his dean would rewrite them. <laughs> And uh, so he was, uh, the board was ready to move, but it, I was pleased to know that I had uh, given a substantial nudge to, <laughs> to his becoming an emeritus. That's a very nice euphemism <laughs> for being let go. Um, <laughs> and also a great opportunity to reflect on higher education finance and uh, revenue streams from, uh, from tuition and what how, how yeah. different people think about investing those back into students or not. Um, what I'm struck about by when we spoke last week over the phone and even in your story right now that you're, you really talked about um, the beginning of the vectors was a question of practice, that you wanted to affect practice, yet you ended up building a theory that not only affected practice but really is the foundation of all subsequent uh, student development theories. Um, and many of our uh, students and alumni who are in this uh, room are aspiring scholar practitioners or scholar practitioners uh, themselves already. And I'm wondering what, what message can you uh, share with them about the importance of merging theory and practice in, in their work? Well, you can't really improve either without doing both. I mean, theory that is <clears throat> unenriched and not complexified by your attempt to apply it uh, can't grow, it can't be useful, uh, and <clears throat> conversely, uh, practice in the absence of evidence, I appreciate uh, Susan's comment on the importance of evidence-based decision-making, and that's what the second chapter that in that second section in Cool Passion talks about, what George Koo writes about is our shift from myth to evidence-based decision-making because back in the 50s, all our, uh, with the focus on uh, cultivating the intellect, educational practices were all anchored in all kinds of myths and assumptions and so forth. Uh, so <clears throat> the interaction between collecting evidence, looking at sound theory, then trying to make it work in your particular arena uh, is uh, is uh, critical, and uh, one without the other, the practice without solid evidence and research uh, is uh, erroneous and fallacious, and research in theory, unenriched by practice, is either sterile or irrelevant. I'm reading a wonderful book right now by uh, Michael Lewis called uh, <laughs> called <laughs> The Undoing Project. Yeah. And it's really a, a wonderful story of the evolution of the thinking of these guys who really have been examining the way we think, the way we make decisions, so forth. I recommend it highly. So he makes a case that I'm so stumbling around with <laughs> no I, th I think that uh, that your point about um, oftentimes we uh, we we in the academy think about uh, the importance of theory and practice but I think that often uh, many of us uh, don't really acknowledge the importance of practice in theory and I think that that's a really important uh, 
aspect of enriching our own work and making yeah. sure that our work speaks to those who want to do the practice um, and that we're actually partners in advancing thought and uh, society through that practice. Yeah. Um, I have one more question before I'm going to turn it over to the audience. So that's the warning for all of you that I'm turning it over to you to so think of a question or two to, to ask. But in retrospect, what has surprised you over the past uh, 55 years since you first uh, <laughs> uh, put forth the, the vectors? Well, my biggest surprise was their reception. Uh, I'd worked in these little small colleges, and uh, I had no idea there was such a thing as student affairs. I mean, you know, in the project on student development, our enrollments were 500 or 300, or I think Earlham with 1,000 students was the large, largest college. So after education and identity hit the streets with the award, at, from ACE, I got invited by University of Michigan and Iowa and Berkeley and Michigan State and so forth to come out and <laughs> meet with them and talk about the implications of my work for student affairs. So I quickly sent for their catalogs and so forth, but I really didn't have much to say except that I thought that their programs ought to help uh, <clears throat> student affairs professionals, student services professionals, start to think about themselves more as educators or people who were in a unique position to help then traditional college age students, which dominated higher education, of course, better cope with the developmental challenges, the life challenges they were facing as late adolescents and young adults, and also help them cope better with the challenges and experiences they were running into uh, as they encountered this new then largely a residential environment. I, I remember vividly, and I think it was 71 or 72, NASPA asked me to give a keynote speech and gave me an award. And uh, so I made this pitch as strongly as I could that the uh, Student Affairs administrators should not think of themselves as service providers. They should think of themselves as educators. And they also ought to try to address the institutional culture that was focused on cultivating the intellect so that it would recognize that there were other major areas of learning and personal development that the institution ought to be concerned about. <laughs> I can still look out at that audience, and it was polite applause. <laughs> Fortunately, the social hour was right afterwards, so a couple of Manhattans helped me recover from it. <laughs> because uh, I clearly, in the first place, I didn't know the audience. I hadn't met any of those people, really. And I, I, so I didn't have any way to try to connect this passion that I had with the realities of where they were, where they were coming from, and so forth. So I was asking them to take on a kind of responsibility that most of them had never thought about, or that wasn't part of the graduate culture or anything at that time. So that. I was very surprised at how the student development theory was picked up and adapted and adopted and so forth uh, throughout the whole student services 
student affairs arena. Uh, John Dalton, uh, a wonderful vice president for student affairs at Florida State and who's been active in NASPA, co-wrote a chapter, the chapter on the changes in student affairs. Uh, and he does a good job of describing not only how the student development ideas kind of took hold, but also how now student affairs has moved on to a focus on learning, mainly because it was apparently hard to operationalize the seven vectors, operationalize student development when it came to actually working with students and faculty and so forth. I personally don't think it's that complicated, but anyway, that's, that, that's, <laughs> he, he articulates that kind of trajectory very, very nicely and very helpfully there. Uh, particularly during, I mean, I guess my feelings now are not really one of surprise. I've spent most of my time and energy in various multi-institutional projects trying to encourage change in higher education and deal with the intransigent resistance to change. I was surprised when I first started to do that in, <laughs> with that project on student development. I mean, I vividly recall the first meeting when I, after the first year when I met with the presidents and, and we had, I'd done on campus workshops, sharing the data and talking about the implications for teaching and various other things. So I had a, summer, a meeting in the summer at Messiah College, actually, one of the participating colleges. And the first thing I did was go around, I said, let's go around the room and I'd like to hear how you've been acting on what you learned from the research. And <laughs> there was a deafening silence. Mm -hmm. That went on and on and on. And finally, Tim Pitkin, president of Goddard, spoke up and sort of started the conversation. But over the four years of that project, the evidence that we gathered and fed back regularly, not only in weekend workshops, but in written reports, had no impact on that. And that led to a subsequent project, for also funded by NIMH, on strategies for change which started to address such strategies for change issues. <clears throat> so I'm not really surprised by that resistance. I, I am dismayed. I'm dismayed by the degree to which college and university faculty members and administrators who of all people you would think would be ready to capitalize on what we have learned about the educational power of new practices, are so resistant to those. It, I have obviously, with my dewy enthusiasm and concern for experiential learning, been very gratified by the degree to which service learning finally has mm -hmm. started to penetrate the academy. But there's so many other, I mean, we know about <coughs> the educational power of learning teams, of learning communities, of residential learning communities that were first pioneered at Irving by John Whiteley, head of student affairs here. We know about the educational power of collaborative learning. Uh, we know about the power of student faculty research. But all of that stuff is at the margins. You can, more, I, don't, I hope it doesn't happen here, but you can walk around most uh, college and university uh, teaching uh, buildings 
And what you'll hear is a talking face, a talking head, a lecture, a text, and examination is still the dominant teaching methodologies, despite recurrent research, Dave McClellan's first research on the, and Pat Cross's research on the degree to which there isn't any learning that lasts that comes from that kind of educational process. But it still dominates, as far as I know, uh, the whole higher education scene, and uh, that is, is tragic. And then, of course, the other major thing that is very problematic and dismaying is the whole shift in, in funding that you are picking up on from seeing education as a public benefit to a private good and a huge reduction in state support for higher education. In the 50s uh, and early 60s, the whole California state system was essentially free, except for some, some fees. And that was true of uh, most of the state colleges and universities. And that's a hugely unfortunate dynamic. I was, I appreciated hearing Susan comment today, uh, this morning about, and I agree with her wholeheartedly, about the current election and political dynamic being a sign of the failure or a limitation of higher education. We have not generated a citizenry with the intellectual competence uh, with the values, with the emotional intelligence to address our attempt to create this multicultural, multi-globally interdependent participatory democracy. In fact, we're moving in the other direction and I have to hold higher education with its emphasis on the intellect and increasingly on uh, professional and occupational development accountable for that. And we need to turn that around. And it is a hopeful sign, of course. I like Bernie and, and know him. <laughs> His wife uh, was on the board of Goddard with me. And it is encouraging to see that uh, there is some momentum towards seeing community colleges, at least, as a, a necessary extension of free public education. Yeah, I, any student who, 1971 uh, keynote at NASPA, which you had to have a couple of Manhattans <laughs> to recover from afterwards, um, was just 35 years too early for lots of people where we moved from the extracurricular activities to co-curricular activities and ACPA changing their name to right. College Student Educators International. So you were, you were, you were 35 years early, <laughs> um, as with the, the theory building, and, that, and that's just so exciting. And that, that you're able to uh, uh, share the story with us today is just uh, inspiring. And, uh, and I'll give a plug for the book too. <laughs> Pick it up to, 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 to learn more, but I want to uh, turn it over to the audience to take an opportunity to ask some questions. First of all, it's wonderful that you're here today. Your, your presence brought me out of the wilds of New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> very far away uh, to come. And I brought my uh, blog here dissertation where you have a chapter just about from about 40 years ago when I wrote it. OK. Um, so uh, <laughs> under Tom Lehman's uh, supervision. Um, you kind of answered my question because you had a very uh, profound, I think, uh, statement in educational identity about the conditions of our existence being man-made and subject to you know the changes in the environment and, and all of this and whether or not the future would be made uh, in a positive way would be subject to colleges and universities so you've kind of answered where colleges and universities have not fulfilled that mission i think today i wound up working at the brookdale in uh, new jersey which is one of the two or three colleges founded on student development principles my title has student development in it, 
and they have strayed so much I think, from the whole <coughs> educational system. I think the uh, CCRC is one of the few places that's really resurging a lot of the, the principles that can be applied to practice. But I think it's, it's dismaying to me that so many forces are arrayed against the kind of principles and values that are at the heart of this. And uh, from financing higher education, the stuff I was doing 45 years ago here, was exactly in the right direction in investment in human capital with students. And today, students I work with at a community college are just burdened by debt, and community college is inexpensive. They diminish job opportunity. So it's a whole upside down world. And again, you kind of answered the question I was formulating, but in this environment with social justice, justice issues at stake in the current political environment, do you, I try to retain it, do you have a hope that this stuff can start to become a force again in our culture and in our country? Well, as our uh, speakers this morning indicated, it's hard to survive without hope. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I keep banging away and uh, have hope. Uh, <clears throat> but the forces of regression are so powerful. Uh, when I was a founding academic vice president of Empire State back in 71, and from 71 to 77, when I went to Memphis State, we created a program where our, our mission from Ernie Boyer was to create an institution that would serve the diverse educational needs of adult learners or students throughout the state of New York. So we created a program really anchored in my experience at Goddard, where every student pursued an individualized degree program with individual learning contracts. And the learning contracts could range from a month to uh, six months. So we wanted to shape the education to the purposes instead of working all teaching into the crusty's bed of a semester. Uh, and we help create the Council for the Assessment of Experiential Learning, now the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, where we at Empire State granted up to three years of credit for assessment based on learning from prior work and life experiences. Now that institution has become almost entirely course-based. They have a very profitable and successful center for distance learning. And if, <clears throat> if you want to take individual differences seriously, with all the available resources now that students have through various communication information technologies, the richness with which you could individualize education it's fantastic, but what is it? It's batch processing. You know, we have a medical establishment now that is significantly moving to individualized medicine based on, on genomes and on a more sophisticated understanding between the interaction of an individual and certain kinds of drugs and treatments. So medicine is moving to individualize seriously. Go buy any car lot and you'll see 500 different kinds of vehicles trying to respond to people's different interests and tastes. But in education, we're still batch processing people that are different dramatically in learning styles and neuro-linguistic processing. I mean, we have a whole series of different ways to assess individual differences that have implications for teaching and learning and institutional cultures and so forth, but we ignore them. So that's frustrating. I'm, I'm just wondering, just by what you're just saying, how did we get to this place where we're so anti-intellectual and anti-educational? Um, with all that we know, you, you expect that technology yeah. and, and that we would progress at that. You know, Regress at this point. Well, I'm not enough of an educational historian to be able to say anything very intelligent about that. I mean, I've 
observed it happen, and it's been a sort of slow, incremental process. When I was at George Mason, I was at, in Northern Virginia from 87 to 96. And each year, the state support would be reduced by X number of dollars because the state revenues had to be used increasingly for prisons. And so money that was allocated to higher education a lot went to prisons. And so every time we, our state support was increased, we increased tuition. One of the, I, I got 500 bucks, 500,000 to do a cost-benefit study of Empire State, and I hired a research team. Uh, and uh, we did a very good work looking on the impact on students in relation to their costs. And at that time in the 70s, our uh, total educational costs were $2,250 per student, compared with about five or 6000 at the other state colleges and universities. And at that time, it cost $68,000 a year to have somebody in Attica and our Rochester Learning Center, had, some of our mentors went and worked with those Attica inmates. And it was a wonderful experience. It, it, it helped that the first faculty member to do that was a gorgeous, well-built redhead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've lived through that, but I don't know enough about other than my personal experiences of how that dynamic has worked to give you any more substantial answer. We have time for one more question. Um, touched up, I think you touched on this without explicitly using the word. Um, I come from, I come to te Teachers College from a poli sci, political science and political theory background. And a the big buzzword in this field is neoliberalism. So my question is rather twofold. Do you agree that there are strongly neoliberal instances in our society? And if so, in what other ways has neoliberalism influenced student affairs in higher education? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have prejudices about uh, Uh, a whole range of political issues and cultural issues, but how they interact with current student affairs. I mean, I, I, I've been retired since 96, and I, I have been involved with the world of adult learners uh, a good bit during that time. I still am in, in various ways, but I've been out of the mainstream of fire education pretty much since then. So. And I stopped reading the Chronicle probably 10 years ago. Or so. <laughs> I really am not in a capacity. I mean, when I do still read, need it, to read the I still every day. <laughs> I enjoy reading it when I do, but I don't feel a need to be generally informed anymore. Whereas before, I eagerly went to the Chronicle and absorbed as much as I could. So I, I don't have any basis for responding. I, I think that uh, that your thoughts about uh, the the changing move from uh, the public good to the private good, um, and how uh, states are thinking about where their uh, tax, tax dollars go, whether it is to the prison system or to the education system. Uh, is uh, a perfect example of the neoliberal forces on higher education. So you have more to say than you <laughs> than, than uh, you realize on that uh, on that topic. Mm -hmm. um, but we are just about out of time. So um, it's been wonderful. It, this hour went by like five minutes for me, and I'm sure for everyone in in the audience. And just thank you so much for everything that. Uh, uh, you have done for our field and for really being a futurist and, and pushing us to uh, realize your, your cool passion uh, for our work. So uh, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the Academic Festival. Thank you.